we're gonna machine this out of a piece of plastic with the CNC, and that's gonna hold uh, 16 of the ultrasonics at once. So we've got two rows of eight here. But yeah, we obviously use the, the shape of the rangefinder in order to uh, create the dimensions and everything for the pocket so they match, and it should grab it fairly tight. So the idea is that we can stick them down in there nice and tight, and that'll hold them, and it'll position them perfectly, and then we can run the machine around the top of all the rangefinders and cut the holes at the top. It's gonna actually go in the rover upside down like that, and then there's gonna be a circuit board with a pair of NeoPixels underneath it that'll touch right at the bottom of these and they'll shine up into the, into the eyes. That's, why, that's the way we're gonna get the eyes to light up. So there's a real challenge in going from this drawing in SolidWorks, which is something I'm pretty experienced with and it, it wasn't too hard to create this, uh, but there's a real challenge in going from this to telling the CNC machine how to actually cut this thing out. You use software called CAM software, C-A-M, uh, which basically uh, creates the tool path that the cutter is going to follow as it goes and cuts things out. So, you know, should it uh, cut this part out of it first? Should it go, you know, how deep should it go? How hard and fast should it cut through the material? And depending on what kind of a, a tool you're using, you need to optimize all those different uh, measurements, you know, as far as how deep and how far and how fast. So I used one of the automated features in this uh, this new cam software I found. It's called uh, Autodesk Fusion 360, and believe it or not, it's actually free. There's a plugin you can get for SolidWorks that I was going to use way back when I first started doing this, and I found out that it costs several thousand dollars. And as near as I can tell, I think this may actually be part of the same plugin or based on the same plugin. But uh, Autodesk, which is kind of the main competitor to SolidWorks, um, actually offers this for free. I'm letting it automatically calculate this toolpath, and there's quite a bit of cuts here. But what it does is the the cutter. This is the cutter up here, and it's going to come in, and it's calculated exactly uh, based on all kinds of stuff that I specified. I'll show you all the stuff I had to plug in here. So we plug in how fast the tool is going to turn, um, how fast it's going to ramp in, how fast it's going to cut. Um, this is this right here in machining is really important. It's called feed per tooth and it's kind of a weird measurement but it basically is a measure of how much stress you're putting on each tooth on the on the cutter and each cutter is, uh, specifies different you know specs for this so that you get it off the data sheet for the cutter. And this is what we're going to cut. These are where it's gonna start and stop for its heights. You can see it in the background there. It's got some levels there. This is where the tool is gonna to start and stop and retract to. And this specifies how deep I want it to go, um, how far I want it to step over every time it goes from, from one cut circle to the next, to the next, to the next, how far do I want it to step over. And that's based on the diameter of the, of the tool. We're gonna to try to cut this whole thing with a 1 8 inch uh, cutting bit. So once you specify all that, it generates this toolpath for you, and it, it took longer to do than I thought it was going to. It took probably 15 minutes for it to process uh, before it came up with this. So now we're gonna try and actually cut this thing for the first time. We're gonna spit this out in a G-code file, which is just a text file that gets fed to the machine one line at a time, and it commands the head to move uh, one bit at a time. And we can also, this, this program's kinda cool because you can actually simulate. There's our, our stock surface, and we can actually simulate and we can actually see the tool starting to cut into the material there and so we can actually watch this whole thing play out if we wanted to I can speed it up a bit and we can see as it chews through the material there that's the profile it's going to go and uh, sometimes it's, it's good to watch this whole thing go through and just make sure that it's not going to do something weird um, or make sure that it's not doing something really inefficient when I first uh, generated this the first time for some reason it cut over here and then it would go over here and it was like back and forth and back and forth and these uh, uh, yellow travel lines they were all over it so all it was going to do is go back and forth I don't know why it did that but I played with some of the options a bit and it looks like it's going pretty smooth right now so uh, so we'll spit this out in a text file and we'll go plug it into the machine and we'll do a test cut on some scrap material that I have and we'll see uh, see what it comes up with wow so this is the file that it generated, and I can see right down here at the bottom, it's 65,000 lines long, and that's to cut one pocket. And so that's every one of those little movements and corkscrews and every single line of this is a small movement that the machine's gonna make. Okay, so here it is inside the software that's gonna actually cut it out. All right, so we got a block of scrap material. We're gonna try, and I'm gonna cut one of them out right here, and then I can test fit one of the ultrasonics in there and just see what the fit and finish looks like and just make sure it looks good before we try to do the actual production block. All right, that should be 10,000 RPM right there. And we'll push go. 
All right, we're all done. That looks pretty good. Yeah, that looks really good. The other thing I noticed when it was running is it's it, it was taking a lot of time to smooth these contours, and the contours are far smoother than they really need to be. I mean, they're so they're really really smooth. So I'm going to go back and re-edit the program for it, and I'm going to have it make those a little bit less uh, fine, so that the whole thing should run quite a bit faster. I actually did a little test while this thing was running. Uh, once I noticed it was taking a long time, it just kept going over these edges, just over and over and over, getting them nice and fine, uh, which looks real pretty, but it's just not necessary for what we're doing right here. And uh, if, uh, if we can cut that out, that'll cut down the cut time by like probably about half. It worked just fine, but it was just a little bit tight. That's one we were looking at before. The next one I ran, I don't know what I did wrong in setting up the toolpath, but it only cut part of the way down. Um, I flipped on an option that I, I guess I mis misunderstood what, what the option was supposed to be. And when I try it on this one, it fits perfectly. That's just ideal right there. It doesn't move at all. So I think we're ready to try it on the big block now and we'll see how it comes out. It should take about five and a half hours to route all 16 of them. This program is almost a million lines of code. We'll see how it does. And away we go. All right, we're moving right along here. It's been running for a few hours now. After it cut the first few, I went and started test fitting the units in there, and I realized that for some reason the pockets were a little bit undersized. So I went back and kind of edited it in the software, and I played with the toolpath a little bit, and I was able to go back and recut the first five. I had to just do the pockets just so they would fit down in there. And where the pins went through, I was going to do those on the drill press, and I started trying to, but I just couldn't get them straight. So um, there's no real particular reason to hold the pins in a certain configuration, so I just went ahead and had the machine just punch all the way through the bottom. So now the pins just fit right down at a little hole that's down inside there, and they fit down in there real nice. And we're done. Okay, so that took a lot longer to run than the software said it was going to, but they all look really clean. As it's been running, I've been going along with this test unit and kind of poking it into the holes as it's going, and they all look identical. They're all, they're all fitting real nice. All right, we're about to test drilling some holes now. I'm gonna get this thing started. All right, I got my zero set where I think it belongs, and we'll try our first cut. We'll see what happens. Fail. That would have been a lot funnier if I hadn't just destroyed that bit. Oh, did you destroy the bit? I think so. Yeah, that's not the way that was supposed to work. No. Ow. And I just cut myself. Not off to a very good start on this one. Yeah, I think we can call that one a fail. Yeah, that looks pretty good right there. So I think that's the best result we've gotten so far. It's got uh, two nice clean holes. Um, I did a 1 8 inch uh, end mill, and what I did in this in, in this case, instead of trying to punch in and then carve the hole, I'm just using a little bit of a bigger end mill, and I'm punching right straight through it, almost like a drill. And I've got nice clean holes right there, so I think that's gonna work out just fine. Um, I just went over and checked and uh, got another uh, end mill order that's the same size, that's specifically designed for aluminum, and they're sending it out today. I should get it tomorrow, and then we'll get back over here and we'll try to actually start punching some holes out of these. So if anyone's interested in what these things actually look like inside, uh, you know, when I first started doing this, I was a little bit concerned that if the little flakes end up inside here, like what kind of actual electronics are inside these little openings and making sure that we're not gonna cause any kind of problems there. So the one that I destroyed with all my little test cuts here, I went ahead and uh, took, some, took some cutters and cut the ends off to try to figure out exactly what, what goes on inside of this thing. And I'd seen drawings before, so I already kind of had an idea of it, but it's kind of it's kind of cool the way they build it. It's, it's actually really simple inside. What you've got here is 
the main piece of metal that you see right here is just a little thin sheet of aluminum and it's got a little piezo element stuck to the back of it just like the little uh, sound chirpers that we're going to put on there and there's one electrical connection it's pretty hard to hold here there's one little electrical connection that touches the piezo and then this one touches the other side of it the uh, i guess the grounding side or the opposite side and so that makes your electrical connection across there and this was before i pulled it off of here this little uh, material you see all over the place here it was like some sort of like caulking or putty or whatever that had this glued on this little plastic base right here and the other one you can see is still attached these uh, posts that go through there's a little tiny hair wire that connects from here to the one connection and a little hair wire from here to the other connection and then the little lenses that you see on the front when you look in there you kind of if you look into it it kind of looks like a like a lens inside of a lens it's this little thing right here and all it is is a little thin piece of aluminum and there was a little dot of like potting material or something on it which you can still see right there and it basically just glued right onto there once i knocked it a little bit it fell right off and it won't go back on but when we go through and cut it, we're going to be real careful and make sure that um, the cut we're making is already is a little bit out ahead of these these elements. So even if it does go all the way through, it's not going to hit anything. But we'll you know control the cutter so when it goes through, it just punches through the aluminum and it doesn't go anywhere anywhere beyond that. But anyway, so I think what this thing does is it just kind of creates a sound and it probably uh, serves some directionality of it also. But basically, this piezo just oscillates at a certain at a certain frequency and that's controlled by the little driver chips on the back of it and it sends a uh, sound uh, a sending signal out one end and you can see there's actually a T and an R so that would tell me this is probably the transmit side and this is the receive side so it sends out an ultrasonic uh, sound ping and then it bounces off of whatever and then when it comes back it's listening for it on this one and so it just kind of creates the reverse uh, waveform and depending on how long it takes for that to return they can determine what the what the range is so I'm not too worried about harming anything inside here there's not really anything that can short out uh, the the piezo is sealed with that potting material all the way around the back of it there So, you know, even if we got something in there I'm not worried about it harming anything when I was cutting I noticed that the cutter actually pulled most of the aluminum chips flew out the top with the cutter So it's not like stuff fell down inside anyway So I, I feel really good about the way that's gonna work out as for the can itself I noticed when I was cutting you can actually see it's a double wall design here on the prototype one that I built a long time ago I just used a Dremel to cut through there and I didn't notice a double wall design like that But these are the production ones that we have and when I punched it just now I did notice that double wall and I was a little bit concerned at first that if there was some electrical You know something that they need to remain electrically isolated and so that's actually what spurred me to take this whole thing apart in the first place and it turns out it was no big deal But this is one of the ones you can see we did all these test cuts chewing it all up here But it's kind of a genius design They they did a, like a can inside of a can and it's I think that the reason they did that was just to hold The little screen in place that goes over the front of them. There's this little screen right here and what they did is that screen was sandwiched right in between the two. So I think they take the outer can, they drop the screen in, then they put the inner can in it, and you can see the inner can has kind of a sharp edge to it on the back, and the outer can is what actually bends and bevels over, which holds the whole thing on there. And so they probably have a press machine that just goes and drops them under, then cinches it onto the back. And so the outer can gets bent around the back side of that plastic, and the plastic is mounted to the through-hole pins that come through on the backs like that. So you can find some different uh, schematics of how these things work these things are real common and there's uh, all, all kinds of discussions out there about people talking about what ICs these are and how they actually work uh, so you can find that part of it but I was never able to find anything on exactly what the design of the inside of these things actually look like so uh, there you have a little bit of an idea of how they work anyway all right, so I've got the new cutting bit on there and I tested it on one and it worked just fine so I've got the whole thing populated now we're gonna try to go through a run all the way across I'm going along and I'm using a tool just to hold it down, just to make sure that as the bit grabs it, it doesn't pop it up out of there. All right, away we go. I turn up the speed a little bit. Yeah, it's working real nice. Turn it up a little bit higher. Feels like the cut's a little cleaner with it running faster. Oh yeah, that definitely feels cleaner.
Okay, I'm pretty happy with that. This one got away from me and pulled out of there. Let me check it out and make sure I didn't damage the inside of it. Is that it? That one looks fine. Maybe it was this one. Yep, that was the one. I dinged. I dinged the inside of it right there. So it looks like as long as they stay tight down in there, then they'll be fine. That one looks fine. Good clean cuts in it. So I'm going to go over and test them all now. I'm just going to make sure I'm getting good range results out of each one of them. Just to make sure I'm not causing any type of damage inside. But they look fine. And I don't think the cutter is getting anywhere near the internals there. So I think this is going to be just fine. Alright, I got the test fixture running now. I'm kind of looking over my shoulder and seeing what readings I'm getting. I'm measuring the distance between here and the microscope. And that looks, that looks about right. I'm getting 90 millimeters right there solid. Just go right down the line here. I don't plan on testing every one that we drill like this, but after the first batch of them, I'm just gonna go through and see if I find any failures at all. If I find any that appear to be misbehaving at all, I just wanna make sure that the, that the vibration from the cutting doesn't damage the hair wires inside of them or anything like that. Yeah, they're all measuring right in the range that I expect to see. This is the one that I dinged. If I look in there, I can see that the little secondary lens in there is kind of bent over a little bit. Let me see if I if it still works. Oh, amazingly enough, it works. It works just fine. So there's the last one right there, and that one's fine. I'll go back to the one I messed up. Yeah, it's still reading about five or ten higher than the others were. But anyway. So we drilled all of them and they were fine and the only one that I dinged right there was just the one where I let the tool slip off. I was holding the holding the tool down on it when it was machining it and just as it started to hit the vibration kind of hit it and my tool slipped off and it kind of popped it up a little bit and the cutter dinged the inside of the lens there. So as long as we're careful not to do that, I think we're just fine. So it looks like we have done solved this, uh, this challenge here and these holes line up real nice. I took uh, one of the head units and this is the bracket that holds the whole thing together. And these are the two pixels right there. And when you drop that in there, it lines up the holes right on top of the pixels. And when I turn it on, it looks, it still looks pretty good. Let me see if I can get it to turn back on here by resetting it. There you go. So you can see those are nice and bright. It's totally working. That's 200 brightness. You can set the brightness between zero and 255 of each one of the colors. So this is red, green, and blue set at uh, 200. And of course that causes the, um, the light to shine white. And right there, that part of the test, that's a pretty low brightness. That's down at, I think it's about 30 brightness. So you can see in a dark room, you can see you still got a nice little bit of a glow there. So yes, yeah, so that's how we modify the range finders. Anyone that wants to do something similar, I would say that the trick is just trying to cut a nice clean hole through the bottom there. And you should be just fine. Just be careful you don't ding the inside elements. And then you can make uh, these ultrasonics uh, light up any color you want. Fail.